up, everyone? How are you? It's good to be here. Glad that you all are here. Want to let you know about uh, coming up uh, next month, we're going to do a new sermon series called Hot Topics. We are not shying away from the hard stuff. And uh, we actually have a survey. It's up there. If you want to grab your smartphone right now, you can go there. Uh, and there's about 20 things you can vote on, uh, everything uh, from politics and faith, suicide, universalism, immigration, uh, gun control, horoscopes, LGBTQ issues, evolution, everything. And I need you to pray for our church as well because we're not shying away from the hard topics, uh, which means every year there's a few people mad at me. Uh, and uh, we have this phrase in our church, everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome and everyone gets to read the same Bible together, right? So we're, we're not, we don't shy away from those things. So vote on that. You can vote for five things. We'll preach on the top four, and uh, we'll go from there. It takes about two minutes to do that. So if you can do that for us, that would be great. And also, that might be a chance for you to say, these are, actually, I know people would want to come if our church was preaching on this. So just do that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about stop signs. There is this thing in California you may know about known as the California Rolling Stop, okay? And I remember learning about this in driver's training because I was doing driver's training, and I did one of these rolling stops, and the instructor said, that's not the right way. And he, I said, well, what is the right way? And he said, let me show you. So we go up to the next stop sign. He said, you stop behind the line, and then you stop completely, and then you let off on the brake so that you don't lurch backwards, but you do a whole count back for one, and then you go. And I had two thoughts at the time. My first thought was, this is taking forever. And the second thought, I thought, and I actually said this out loud, was, that's not the way my parents drive. <laughs> and this didn't go over that well with the instructor. And the instructor said, well, your parents are doing it the wrong way. And here's the thing. I've known people in my life, tragically, who've been hit by people who've blown through stop signs. Okay? And that's causes accidents or you're living dangerously. Or I have friends who are like, no cop, no stop. They just, that's, that's their mentality. And here's the thing, I know that a lot of us think the same way with God's stop sign. God trying to say stop, and I know you're here, super glad you're here, you stopped, you're weak to be here, that's awesome. But I think overall in life we're just run, 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 and we're blowing through God's stop sign just hoping that we're not going to cause damage to ourselves or to other people, and we're so frantic, and God's trying to say, look, there's a different way to live life. And if you have kids, just like with my parents in the stop sign, we're actually passing on busy, 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 busy to our kids. And it's just frantic. And I just wonder if we could just, every day, just stop. Just stop. Just be in God's word and hear him speak and know what he's asking us to do. And so what I want you to do is I want you to do this with me right now. I want you to just close your eyes. And just have a minute with God. And just let him talk to you. Maybe you've got a lot going on. And you just got to pour out your heart. And maybe what you need is for him to pour into you. Maybe things right now are great and you just need to say some thanks to him. Dear Lord, help us to stop so we can hear from you so that we won't get stuck in this rat race that the world wants us in. Help us to follow you in your pace. In Jesus' name, amen. How do you feel? How'd that feel? Yeah? That's what I'm basically trying to ask you to do today. And Serena's gonna come up here in just a minute and I'm gonna finish out the sermon, but... That's basically what we're talking about today. What you just did to do that for 15 minutes a day to just get yourself centered in on Christ. We come here, we go, man, it feels good. But it would change the way we did everything. And I found that even Christians who are coming to church and being solid, they're blowing right by God's stop sign every single day. That's what we want to encourage you to do, to get a different rhythm 
of your life. All right? So we're going to hear a story about a donkey right now. Let's invite Serena up on stage. Let's give her a hand as she comes on up. Okay, this is the story of Balaam's donkey. And if you want to go on and turn to Numbers 22, grab one of the Bibles in front of you or get out your Bible phone app. Now, the story is about Balaam, who's a prophet. He's not an Israelite. He's not a good guy. And the king of Moab has called him to curse God's people. So let's pick up the story in Numbers 22, 21. So the next morning, Balaam got up, saddled his donkey, and started off with the Moabite officials. But God was angry that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. As Balaam and two servants were riding along, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey bolted off the road into a field. But Balaam beat it and turned it back onto the road. Stubborn donkey. Then the angel of the Lord stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved farther down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by at all. This time, when the donkey saw the angel, it lay down under Balaam, and in a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal again with his staff. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. What have I done to you that deserves your beating me three times? It asked Balaam. Well, you have made me look like a fool, shouted Balaam. Doesn't that just give us a selfie of his heart? You have made me look like a fool. If I had a sword with me, I would kill you. But I am the same donkey you have ridden your entire life. Have I ever done anything like this before? No, Balaam admitted. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Why did you beat this donkey three times, the angel said. Well, look, I come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I would certainly have killed you by now and spared the donkey. Then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. I will return home if you're against my going. Hmm, he couldn't even see. Well, Balaam is using religion for his own gain. He's a prophet making a prophet, and he's well known in the land. He's built this reputation for himself, and he loves religion because he's using it to make himself look important and make money on the side. If you go to verse 6, it says King Moab has told him, Come, Balaam, come and curse these people, these Israelites. Because I know the people you curse are cursed and the people you bless are blessed. You see, the people believe Balaam because, well, he has power. They believe that because he's religious. Well, Balaam has some motives. He has some motives, and it's fame and fortune. Fame, he gets to go see somebody important, and he's well known. He's needed by the king of the land, and he's going to make some money and he is on this donkey and he is going and he has set his destination and nothing is going to stop him right hmm have we ever felt that way nothing's going to stop us i just wonder why a prophet a man who declares omens can't see the stop sign in front of him why not Well, maybe we're like that too sometimes. We ignore God. We're ignoring those stop signs that God puts in our path because we want to use religion. We want to use it to make ourselves feel better, to make ourselves look better. I'm sure nobody in here has ever done that. I've probably done that a few times. But God wants more for us than that. 
He wants more. And I just got to throw out the busy thing again because our agendas, agendas, we figure our agenda for the week, for the month, and we just keep going and going, and we want to spend time with God, but somehow it ends up at the bottom of the list oftentimes. And when the days turn into weeks, then we're basically saying, well, God, I've got it all figured out. I figured out my problems. Any potential problem, I've got it solved. So I just need your stamp of approval for this month, and we'll call it good. You can go help somebody else. But God loves you far too much to let that happen. Too much he loves you. He will work in your life to slow you down, to slow me down, so we aren't ignoring the stop signs, right? So we know what he's doing in our life because we want to avoid being like Balaam. Does anybody want a talking donkey experience? I can't even say it. Do you? Some of you might. I don't know. Tim wants to see a talking donkey. Okay, Tim. We'll sign you up. God wants to build a relationship with you. He longs for that deep relationship with you so you can hear him, so you can discern him. Now, for many of you, you're already here. You've given up your day, so I know I'm preaching to the choir. But he loves to hear your voice. He knows your ringtone. And we have to believe that every time we open our Bibles, not just half the time, but every single time that Hebrews 11.6 is true, that God exists and that he is a rewarder of all those who diligently seek him. You see, every time you spend even two minutes with God, he's there. He's on it. He does not delay. He's ready to pour his strength, his endurance, his stamina, his wisdom, his peace, his joy, anything anything that you need but we must believe and what does God say just faith as small as a mustard seed and give your best time to God your best brain time and if possible make it your first time of the morning if you can rise up in the morning open that word Get in there and see what he has for you. Our church makes it so easy for us. Amen? Yes. We have the published devotionals, and then we have the online devotionals that you can jump on and post a comment or like one of the other comments there. Now, don't choose Psalm 119 unless you just want to read a huge chapter. Choose a small bit and ask God to read it with you. And then reflect like we did on this passage. God, what do you want me to see from this Balaam passage? Well, Serena, Balaam was using God. He was using religion to make himself look better, to feel important, okay? So how many times have I wanted to do things for God instead of with God? There's a difference, right? God doesn't need us to do things for him but he so loves it when we do things with him. So if we can commit then and respond, read, reflect, respond, and give him 10 minutes every day, at least 10 minutes reading the word and five minutes in prayer, what a difference that would make in my discernment, in my energy level, and I know it would for you as well. Now, some of us might say, prayer, oh my goodness, I don't know where to begin, and my prayers aren't good enough, words come out all jumbled. Well, who told you that? Did God say that? God loves to hear your voice. He knows your voice, each and every one of you. And yet, if we still persist with that argument, remember the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples, 12 Jewish men, asked Jesus, how to pray. Why is that when they grew up in Jewish homes that prayed throughout the day and in the synagogue? Because they recognized something different in Jesus. Jesus stopped. He didn't keep going. Did he have the opportunity to keep going? He did, right? So many people needed him. So many people needed to be healed. And yet, 
He only went where the Father said, and he only did what the Father gave him to do. He didn't heal everyone. And so Jesus, though, gave them the Lord's Prayer. Holy God, we're recognizing his faithfulness, his majesty. And then we go on, God, build your kingdom right here, right here. Because it has to be built here first, right? And then lead me away from temptation, deliver me from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Now, this is not a formula. It's a model prayer, right? It's a model that Jesus gave us. They're words, but make them your own. Make them your own words. And then there's the fact that, remember what Paul says in Ephesians 6.18, pray with all kinds of prayers and petitions. Never stop. Never stop. I have to tell you, my favorite part of prayer is praying when I'm not even really awake. Does that seem silly? <laughs> my eyes are halfway open or not at all, and I just say, good morning, God. Good morning. Because in Psalm 127, 2, God tells us, I'm giving to you. I'm giving to you, blessing you while you sleep. So wouldn't it make sense that before we're even fully awake, we're going to stop? We're going to acknowledge the king of the universe and that he wants to stop and spend time with you. I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing. And he can give us things when we're barely awake. I have some of my best conversations that way. And then when we're feeling a cloud settling in over us, we can turn to the Psalms. How many people love the Psalms? How many people have lived in the Psalms? I know I have. They meet every need. They certainly do. Psalm 40, 17. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, The Lord is great. As for me, I am poor and needy. I'm going to recognize my humble state because I know I'm the child and he is the father. Lord, keep me in your thoughts. You are my helper, God. You are my Savior, Jesus. My God, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, do not delay. And he is there with you. Do not wait to spend time with God because you know what happens? We will have that Balaam complex. We will think we can go it alone with just stopping at the quick stop of prayer for two minutes and getting that supersized drink. It's not enough. It's not enough. Start talking to God the beginning of the day and never stop it's a conversation and it will keep us in his care it will keep us in that mode of discernment where we know what he wants for us step by step we won't walk in confusion because confusion is not of him we won't miss those stop signs that Balaam had and we won't have a talking donkey experience. So the question is, when will you open his word and spend time with him so you're not using religion just for your own gain? Good job, Serena. Very fun. All right, let me catch you up on where we've gone so far, okay? You know what we're trying to ask you to do, to make spending time with God for 15 minutes a day a part of your habit and routine. Uh, we talked about a warning that with the story of Balaam's donkey that if, if you don't actually focus in on God, you will even use the things of God for your own selfish reasons. You'll start to evaluate church, ministry, everything in terms of how it makes you feel. And that will become your litmus test because you're not focused on God. You're focused on yourself and you're using it for yourself like Balaam did, okay? What we want to do now is I want to talk about what are some of the things that are in the way. And in fact, when people struggle with time with God or struggle to be in church or struggle with whatever, there's actually deeper things going on, okay? So I want you to have another minute with God.
Let's stop again. And just let God kind of talk to you about, hey, why is this a struggle in your life? What's going on? We're going to talk about that. Dear Lord, help us not to feel guilt. Help us to understand you're inviting us to sit down every day to talk with you. We are your children. You wanna talk to us because you love us. Help us to not run away from you and help us to hear your warning today that when we skip your stop sign again and again, we're living in the danger zone. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, let me ask you this question as we dump, jump into this kind of what's going on inside of us. Do you feel like, man, I am overwhelmed with how much spare time I have in my life? How many of you are like, yeah, that's, that's me right now? Yeah? Okay. Oh, yeah, we got, we got one. Amen. Hallelujah. The world's going to take that away from you. Okay. How many of you are like, I am so well rested right now. Like I just have energy just oozing out of my ears. Yeah, once again, so now there's two, there's three or four. I didn't say caffeine. I just said well rested, okay? Uh, you see what I'm saying? Do you understand that you're living in a culture that has taught you from the beginning your worth is in what you do and how hard you work and everything that you accomplish and the busier you are, the better person you are right? And in fact, it's even dangerous sometimes in some of your workplaces to let people know that you're happy because it's like, then I'm going to work that happiness out of you. Like there's something wrong with you. You're not supposed to be happy and have balance in your life or rhythm in your life. We're going to get that out of you, okay? Uh, and here's the thing. When we start to live into those lies, when we start to live into that rat race, then we get addicted to the cheese, right? and we miss the point of what it's really all about. Here's what it says in Jeremiah 35, 15. We're gonna put this up on the screen. Time after time, I sent you the prophets. God is saying like, I'm trying to tell you this again and again and again. Turn from your wicked ways and start doing things right. Stop worshiping other gods so you might live in peace here in the lands I've given to you and your ancestors, but you wouldn't listen to me or obey me. You know the crazy thing? One of the reasons they wouldn't listen to God is because they kept going to church. They thought, oh, that's great. If I'm going to church, I don't need to listen to God because I'm going to church. I've already checked that box. I don't need to actually spend time with God. I did my God thing on Sunday morning, okay? And he says, I've sent you prophets again and again and again so that you might live in peace here in this land, in your house, in your job, with your family. I sent you a certain way to live, but you don't listen to me. You just want to check off your box. And here's the thing. It's so easy for us just to check off our box. And I'm super glad you carved out the time to be here today, but I want to invite you into a living daily relationship with Jesus Christ who died and rose again and wants to know you. He didn't die so you go to church. He didn't say, come, go to church, and I'll make you fishers of men. He said, come follow me. And yes, if we're following him, we'll wind up together. But I tell you, there's a big difference people who know Gim and they worship him in the morning. It doesn't matter if they like the song or not because it's not their song. It's not, it's, we're not singing to you. We're singing to Jesus, right? It's, that, it's, it's living into that sort of thing. But we're so busy and we're busy and we think busy is good. I'll tell you a story. I knew a guy who worked, 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 worked very, 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 very hard. And because he was a hard worker, he got promoted right? And he loved that because that was important to him. That meant a lot to him and he got recognition. That felt good. So he got promoted again and pretty soon now he was waking up early to get everything done. He wasn't really good at delegating. So he just kind of worked more. So he woke up early and he started staying late. And, and now he's just working and working and working and he's got, getting a tightness in his chest. And he's not sleeping well at night, but he's got so many people who depend on him and he's getting these accolades and people are telling him how thankful they are for him. But he's getting some complaints at home. You know, his spouse, his wife is saying, look, I feel like you're not home enough. And, and then the kids are saying, daddy, where are you? And he's, yeah, just one more project, just one more project, which he said for years. When this is one done, then I'm gonna pull back. Then I'm gonna have that, that time. It's an incredible guy, but just has his life out of rhythm, right? And then that project ends and the project goes so well that they promote him again. And he accepts a promotion without even talking to his wife because he knows exactly what she's gonna say. 
And now she's gone silent. And the kids say to him, Daddy, but where are you going to be? Because now it's a new position. So he needs to put in extra time to kind of learn the new position. So there's extra time needed. And he says to his kids the same things I'm saying to his wife for years. Kids, just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. And now that lie is being repeated to the kids. And one day, a coworker finds him at work, on the ground, behind his desk, shaking, having a massive panic attack that's caused a heart irregularity. And he winds up in the hospital. And who's by his side? His wife and his kids. He got a text from his boss. Hope you get better. Can't wait to see you back at work. We miss you. And he had this massive time with God as he was sitting there because he ran so many stop signs that the accident happened. His body literally shut him down. And suddenly he knew what life was all about. Suddenly he understood he had been running away from what life was really all about, that God has got to come first and that his family has got to come right after God. And then everything else has got to get rearranged around that. And he realized he was addicted to recognition, addicted to success. That's what I'm talking about in here. You have deeper things going on. When people say to me, I don't have enough time to pray, I go, you don't have enough time not to pray. Okay? When people say to me, oh, Scott, I need a break from church ministry. My life is overwhelming me right now. It's too much in my life. And I go, let's talk about that together because I'm your pastor and I understand. Let's go through that. And we figure out, and this is what typically happens. What typically happens is we look together and the person is serving less than an hour a week. So they, they serve every other week and it's, it's a half hour per week. So I'm saying this 30 minutes per week is causing your life to spiral out of control. 168 hours per week, but this half hour is the make or break thing. And if you just had that half hour back, then everything else would be fine. There's deeper things going on. There's deeper things like you can't say no to people and you have a serious lack of boundaries and you've let other people control you by being mad at you. And if you let people control you by being mad at you, they'll always be mad at you. And God's just the easiest one because God's always gonna love you and the church will always be here for you and we will. So I can't handle it right now. And the deeper issue of you living without boundaries outside of your priorities never happens. You're working really, 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 really hard. My friends, if you push your car everywhere, you're working really hard, but I don't think you're doing what it was designed for. And if you could just take the time to fill up the tank and do the maintenance on the car, you could drive. And some of you going, but I'm working hard. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You are working really, really hard, but can you understand this un-American statement that I'm gonna say that the answer to life is not hard work. It's being filled with God's power in you, living for his approval alone, and then making the most of this life. Can you you hear this very uncultural thing? Because our culture loves to talk about balance. You like that word? You like that phrase? Balance. You need to keep things balanced, right? You need a little bit of God. Just a little bit. Not too much. Don't be a Jesus freak. And, and just balance out your family. Don't, don't do too much family. Right? And, and then balance out entertainment and things that are bad. Maybe even balance out, you know, chemical addictions. Oh, wait, no, not those. Wait, wait, wait. That doesn't work anymore. Maybe there's some things we should have zero of in our life. Maybe there's some things that we should be addicted to, like Jesus. Maybe Jesus shouldn't be balanced in your life. Maybe there should be an abundance of Jesus in your life. Okay? And then you start to realize you don't want balance. Balance isn't the key. The key is rhythm. And I wonder if you're living at God's rhythm, his pace, his motion. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary. All you who are weary, right? Right? And Jesus says, I will give you rest for my burden is light. And I wonder if I said to you, does your burden feel light? And you'd say no. And I go, then are you taking on way more burdens than Jesus ever asked you to? And, if, and why? If Jesus is the one who says only take on my burdens, why did we take more? And I think the goal is to live at his rhythm. You know, when Jesus walked, there's a cadence to it, right? You walk at a certain cadence. Just kind of do this with me, right? Some of you don't know how to snap. It's okay. You can clap if you want to. 
okay? Okay, and you're trying to live at that rhythm. But the world's gonna come along and they're gonna do like the dance, right? The wrong dance, right? You gotta keep that rhythm, right? They're gonna be like. How many of you kept it? Some of you are off now, okay? Here's the thing, the world, you're gonna feel like, keep going. You can listen and snap your fingers at the same time, people, okay? Some of you are gonna feel like, I lost that rhythm. Somewhere in there, I lost that, it's cool. I can stay at God's rhythm, I'm moving at God's pace because you're so addicted to your hobbies, you're so addicted to your vacations, you're so addicted to what you want in your driveway, you're so addicted to what improvements need to be done in your home that you're neglecting your soul. So you miss the rhythm. And I believe with all that I am, keep it up, that the only way to stay in God's rhythm is to rehear the metronome of time with Jesus every single day. Because if you don't, you'll miss the rhythm. All right, you can stop. Here's what it says in Mark chapter one. Here's what it says in Mark chapter one. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated pray, place to pray. Simon and the others went out looking for him. When they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. You ever have that feeling like everyone's looking for you? Just leave me alone, okay? Jesus was praying alone every day. And I gotta tell you, if Jesus needed to pray, you and I definitely need to pray. And I know what you're thinking, but I'm too busy to pray. I'm working so hard. And I gotta say to you, I gotta say to you, for those of you who are very efficient with your time and hardworking and leaders and developing things and trying to move things, I gotta say to you, are you more efficient than Jesus? Have you in three years created a movement that transformed the world? Maybe there's something that he knew that you don't know. It says, Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns. Now I'm gonna to preach to them. That's why I came. So he traveled throughout the region, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. See, Jesus had power from God because he stopped. And so many of us are like, we just wanna move and move, but we don't understand. Like again, when I talked about the car, there's power under the engine. Get God's power in you. That's what I've been trying to model to you. Five kids in my family doing my doctorate work, but still living at a rhythm that doesn't drive the life out of me. And when all of the people want your attention to learn how to say no, and people may be mad at you for that. And I'm okay with that because I cannot please everyone here. And the power of this church is not through me. It's through Jesus Christ alone. This is not my church. This is his church. I can only do what one person can do. That's all I can do. And I don't expect anyone else to understand that. But I have to live into that. And I spend time with God every single day. And it's the lifeblood of my life. How can you do it without him? How can you do your business without him? How can you be effective? Well, I gotta, I gotta work harder to be effective. No, you don't. You need power. The power of God. You're not gonna please everyone. You can't do that. Okay? We gotta live life at his rhythm. And I think there are deeper things going on. I think there's deeper things going on when we say I don't have time for church, I don't have time for ministry, I don't have time to spend with God. And it could just be that you just don't like stopping anything because you're just addicted to busyness and that's an issue. It could just be, well, yeah, I, don't, I don't like reading, but you know what I love? Technology has taken away all those little lame excuses because now you can do it in the car, now you can listen to it. You know, every single Sunday, there's at least one person who cues their audio Bible. So I know they work, okay? Dave, is it usually you, Dave? <laughs> you're laughing a little too much over there, okay? All right, let's get practical. I wanna give you some very practical tips. We're gonna be quick though, okay? Number one, you gotta have priorities. You gotta prioritize your life. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, okay? Now, I gotta ask you that question. Do you know what your priorities are? And does your time line up with your priorities? God's the most important thing in my life. I just don't spend anything, any time on him. Okay, does your time actually match up? So that leads to number two, have a plan. Psalm 92, teach us to number our days. Here's the thing, before you come up with like, here's I need to rearrange my schedule, actually stop for a couple of weeks or I wanna challenge you today. This is practical stuff here, people. 
go back for two weeks today and go, where did I actually spend my time? So if you go like, God's the most important thing, but yet I spend five hours a week or 10 hours a week looking at a screen. So and you go, I have no time. Well, maybe you're spending a lot of time because I've done this before. And I go, man, I'm spending a lot of time with TV and social media and video games. Don't judge me, okay? And I'm doing a lot of time in those things. And, and m- maybe if I say I have no time, it's because I'm spending my time on these things I actually don't think are important, but I'm, I really like them. I'm not saying you can't do them, but are you actually aware of how much time, where you spend your time? Okay, how long does it take you to get ready? How long's your commute? Like just thinking through those things. Where do you spend your time? Are you aware of your time? Teach us to number our days, oh Lord. A lot of us go, I don't even know where my time goes in the week, 168 hours. It's called the great equalizer. Rich or poor, we all get the same time. And how you use your time is a very important thing in life. God cares. He wants you to use your time well. He wants you to live your time according to priorities. Number three, make the most of your time. Make the most of your time, Colossians 4, 5. Redeem the time, doing God's work, sharing faith with other people, living into what's first, first. Not getting to the end of your life and going, now, someday, in the future, once I get this, then I'll have priorities. Instead of saying, no, now, from a young age, I'm gonna call upon the name of the Lord, I'm gonna live into that rhythm, I'm gonna spend time every day. And I gotta tell you, that 15 minutes with God will change how you see everything in life, everything in life. And it'll probably grow into 30 And I want to challenge you on that because you spend more time than that eating per day. And that's okay. Food's good. Okay? But you'll get to the point where you go, you know, spending time with God is good too. Because you remember when you were a kid and you didn't even want to eat because you wanted to spend so much time playing and your parents had to teach you, you need to eat so you have more energy to go play. You're eventually going to go to the point where you get hungry for God's word. And it's going to give you energy and perspective on the rest of your life. And I got to tell you as your pastor, if you're running away from these things, there are deeper issues going on in you and it's hurting you. And it's hurting others because you're ignoring God's stop sign. And that's not what God wants. And it's not a guilt trip. It's an invitation into a good life full of peace. So the question is, will you do it? Will you spend time with God every day? Will you make that time? When's the best time? That's the question. It's a very practical sermon. Will you spend time with God every day in his word? Okay? I'm gonna tell you a story. There's a guy named Eric Liddell, world-class athlete, Christian. At the 1924 Olympics in Paris, he was favored for the 100-meter dash, but they published ahead of time that the 100-meter dash event would be on Sunday morning. And as a devout Christian, he refused to compete He let it be known. The Prince of Wales and the British Athletic Commission tried to convince him to change his mind and he said, no. That totally shocks us, doesn't it? Us who are willing to compromise Sunday for the first thing that comes along. Oh yeah, I go to church unless something else comes up. He gave up a chance at a gold medal. But instead he trained for the 400 meter which he was a huge underdog. He actually came in with not great time trials, but he won the gold medals in the movie Chariots of Fire. He later became a missionary to China. When Japan invaded in World War II, he was put into a prisoner camp. He died there. And his last words, the words he lived by, complete surrender. Those are the last words that he said. There's something we can understand when we start to understand, I don't have to live for the rat race of this world. I don't have to live for anyone else's approval. My life is for Christ alone. And the only way to get that reminder in your head day after day is to spend time with the creator of love and life and joy and peace. That's the only way to get it bursting out of you as if you're getting it filled up every day. Everything else in life is an imitation of that. Let's pray. Again, third time in this sermon. It's great. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everyone here. And God, my prayer is that coming out of this sermon, there will be a wave of commitment of people spending time daily with you, not out of guilt, but out of gratitude. Lord, may that happen. May your word resonate in this room 
today and may people spend time daily with you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.